They came to Wilson's Creek with their innocence. Men from places like Houston, Olathe, St. Louis, Little Rock, Burlington, and Shreveport. Mere boys out to see the world. Disgruntled men ready to solve a problem with the only option left them. Thousands of soldiers from all across what had been the United States of America. These innocents marched under colorful banners, banners to romantically die for. But at Wilson's Creek, the romance would end. Innocence would be lost. The struggle for Missouri had entered its most desperate hour. Abraham Lincoln's election in 1861 seemed to shore up the South's belief that the newly formed Republican Party intended to destroy slavery and Southern states' rights. They had succeeded in putting their man in office. It was all the proof the South needed. By February 1861, seven Southern states had seceded from the Union. Both sides prepared for war. In bleeding Kansas, abolitionist Jayhawkers and pro-slavery border ruffians had fiercely fought and died over slavery. Their fight for Kansas was over. In Missouri, they would join the ranks and begin where they had left off. June 1861. Missouri remained officially neutral to the unfolding events back east. Yet, secessionist troops were being formed by Missouri Governor Claiborne Jackson. He still hoped to see his state enter the Confederacy. But newly appointed General Nathaniel Lyon, known as a fervent abolitionist throughout the regular army, moved quickly to ensure they never would. In mid-June, Lyon's forces entered Jefferson City, deserted by Governor Jackson. He pursued the fleeing government to Boonville, where the secessionists made a stand. They were no match for Lyon's veteran U.S. regulars. The secessionists fled on to southwest Missouri to join the gathering rebel forces of General Sterling Price. Union Colonel Franz Siegel and his two regiments of German volunteers tried to cut off their retreat at Carthage on July 5th. Siegel was defeated and retreated to Springfield where Lyon was gathering his forces. Bloody but not discouraged, Lyon's regulars joined volunteers from Iowa, Kansas, and Missouri. Lyon, who had never commanded more than a company of men in battle, would soon be faced with the greatest challenge of his life. General Ben McCullough had problems. By July 30th, the Texas Ranger and Mexican War veteran had 10,000 Confederate troops massed around Cassville. He had recently accepted the command of all gathering forces from Missouri General Sterling Price. Price had been governor of Missouri and was a brigadier general during the Mexican War when McCullough was only a captain. Old Pap, his troops like to call him. Price's popularity had helped him to raise close to 5,000 recruits in the past few months. McCullough had problems with the fact that 2,000 of these recruits were unarmed. The rest carried mostly flintlocks and shotguns. Many of his own brigade of 3,000 were low on ammunition. Some of his men carried less than 25 rounds. On top of this, McCullough had little confidence in Price's motley attired farmers. He referred to them as splendid roasting ear foragers, but poor soldiers. His opinion would soon seem to be true. On August 2nd, an advanced rebel division under Missouri General James Rain was attacked near Doug Springs, Missouri. Rain's men were from the area. They knew the terrain, yet they had never fought U.S. regulars. Rain's 2,500 men were sent fleeing by a handful of Union cavalry searching for the Confederate Army. General McCullough called the affair Rain's Scare. 
It seemed to confirm his belief that the Missouri troops wouldn't fight. But on August 10th, these ragged farmers and frontiersmen would prove him wrong. Lyon had problems of his own. He still couldn't locate the main elements of McCullough's army. As he searched, his force of about 7,000 in Springfield was about to diminish to 3,500. The three-month enlistment terms of half his troops would expire within a few days. Many of his soldiers were barefoot. His supply train was held up in Rolla, and he had a rebel army he believed to be four times his own somewhere within a few days' march. On August 8th, First Lieutenant Levant Jones of the 1st Kansas Volunteers, marching with Lyon, wrote his wife. We're all in positions, and with tomorrow's rise, we shall have a desperate and great fight. I wish you to have my last words and thoughts. My life now belongs to my country, but my love belongs to you. As I write, I breathe a prayer to God that he will grant your prayers and mine and bring us once more together. Goodbye, dearest. Levant Jones only lived another day and a half. The morning of August 10th, he was shot through the heart, fighting atop Bloody Hill. The Confederate forces under Generals McCullough, Price, and those recently arrived under Bartlett Pierce had planned to attack Lyon the night of the night. Just as they were beginning to move their forces from camps around Wilson's Creek, it began to sprinkle. Many of the men carried their ammunition in haversacks made of only cotton or canvas. Rain would ruin their paper cartridges. At about 25 rounds per soldier, a heavy downpour could disarm most of McCullough's army. He called off the Confederate attack, but someone made a costly mistake. In preparation to march, McCullough had called in his pickets. They were never reposted. As dawn came to Wilson's Creek on the morning of August 10th, General Lyon would never have a better chance to destroy McCullough's sleeping army. Lyon's Army of the West spent August 9th getting ready. After a month of marching, skirmishing, and waiting, Lyon would finally attack McCullough's Confederates. The decision had been difficult. With no reinforcements on hand, outnumbered over two to one, and soldiers who hadn't been paid in over a month, Lyon's chances seemed slim. But the supply train from Rolla had arrived. No more empty cartridge boxes or growling stomachs. Late that afternoon, about 6,000 men left Springfield to see the elephant. Lyon had decided to divide his forces. He would personally lead 4,500 men and attack the rebels' left flank. Colonel Siegel would move 1,500 men and hit the Confederate rear and right flank. If successful, McCullough's rebels would be caught in a vice. Professor Siegel, they called him. Before the war, he'd taught mathematics at the German American Institute in St. Louis. He'd left Germany to become an American. Many in his brigade of German immigrants from St. Louis barely spoke English. Nevertheless, as the sun began to color the horizon the morning of August 10th, they were in the Confederate rear marching in defense of their new country. McCullough's Confederates were still wiping the sleep from their eyes when Lyon's Union column hit them. Lyon's men had marched most of the night in the rain, bivouacking for a few hours within sight of the Confederate campfires. Led by a battalion of U.S. regular infantry and the 1st and 2nd Missouri Volunteers, Lyon's forces quickly scattered Rain's advanced Confederate cavalry camping along Wilson's Creek. With no pickets to warn of the attack, the rebels were easily surprised. By 6 a.m., Lyon's 1st Kansas and 1st Missouri regiments were beginning to form a battle line on the crest of Bloody Hill. This time, General McCullough saw what Rain's Missourians were running from with his own eyes. The crest of Bloody Hill was dark with Lyon's men. 1,500 men of Price's Missouri State Guard and four cannon under Captain Henry Gibor hastily ended their breakfasts, forming a battle line to meet the Union advance. By 6.30, a fire had opened along the slope of Bloody Hill so loud it was heard 10 miles away in Springfield. 
As Lyon's men continued the fight on the rebel front, Colonel Siegel struck their rear. By dawn, Siegel had placed a battery just east of Wilson's Creek. Hearing the fighting on Bloody Hill, Siegel opened his attack. His cannon immediately began shelling Arkansas, Missouri, and Texas cavalry camped along the west bank of Wilson's Creek. Meanwhile, Siegel's advance guard, the second U.S. Dragoons distinct in their orange trim, and a company of regular U.S. cavalry were crossing Wilson's Creek. By 7.30, Siegel's 1,500 Germans were in Farmer Sharp's field behind the Confederate line. The fighting had grown heavier along the slope of Bloody Hill. A Union battery under the command of Captain James Totten opened on the rebels, forming to halt the Union advance. Totten was regular army, known to drink and swear. Before the war, he'd commanded the U.S. arsenal in Little Rock. Today, he faced one of his students. Across the field stood Confederate Captain William Woodruff and his Pulaski artillery. Woodruff and his crew had learned their craft while serving under Totten at Little Rock. They'd learned well, making many Kansas, Missouri, and Iowa women widows that morning. The Pulaski's guns were positioned on the Confederate right flank beyond a field owned by John Ray. That morning, while his family huddled in the cellar, he sat on his porch in a rocking chair and watched the battle rage throughout his cornfield. Captain Joseph Plummer's 300 U.S. regulars and a battalion of Missouri Home Guards anchoring the Union left flank had crossed Wilson's Creek to take the Pulaski artillery. Around 7 a.m., they were met in Ray's cornfield by the neatly uniformed and well-armed 3rd Louisiana Pelicans, accompanied by Arkansas troops under Colonel James McIntosh. 900 Confederates in all. Plummer was outnumbered nearly three to one. As Plummer's men advanced, rebels camped on the edge of the corn grew nervous. A pelican described it. Who are you? What force is that? cried our colonel. United States troops was the reply. This was said in a tone so authoritative that I confess it for a moment almost staggered me. They fled from the fire into the battle line being formed by Colonel McIntosh's Arkansas troops and the Pelicans under Colonel Louis Hebert. The Federal regulars spread out behind the cover of a rail fence at the edge of the cornfield. The rebels formed a battle line amidst ravines and underbrush. As the sides began to exchange volleys, the firing lines closed to within 30 yards. Captain Plummer faced an old schoolmate across the field. He and Confederate Colonel McIntosh had known each other years ago at West Point. Today, they forgot their alma mater.
battle raged in the cornfield for half an hour. For the first time, the Confederates got a good look at the Federals standing amidst Farmer Ray's corn. A sergeant with the 3rd Louisiana described it. When the smoke cleared away a little, we could see the enemy plainly. They stood as firm as ever, but their ranks were thinned and the dead lay thick. Some of them had been slightly wounded in the head, but they still stood in their places, while the blood running down their faces gave them a ghastly but fierce and determined look. Beyond Plummer's men, a Federal battery under Lieutenant John Dubois had arrived with three six-pound cannon. Supported by the 1st Iowa and a battalion of U.S. regulars, Dubois positioned his guns in the cover of some trees. From this high vantage point, his guns began to pound the Pulaski artillery. Meanwhile, the fighting in Ray's cornfield had resumed. Plummer's regulars were taking heavy casualties, but still managed to rake the rebel line with musket fire. Colonel McIntosh began to rally his troops. He rode along the rebel line shouting, Get up, Louisianans, and charge them. Do you all wish to be killed? The Confederates responded. Their massive attack forced Plummer's men to abandon the cornfield. The rebels swarmed through the corn. The Union regulars covered their retreat well and later crossed Wilson's Creek to join Lyon on Bloody Hill. Up on the ridge, Dubois' guns had forced Woodruff's Pulaski battery to move to the far right of the rebel line. Dubois now trained his guns on McIntosh's rebels emerging from the cornfield. The six-pounders were loaded with grape shot, small metal fragments or mini balls, when fired, the cannon acts like a huge shotgun. The grape shot withered the rebel line. The Arkansas and Louisiana recruits fell back through the corn. They had seen the elephant and had beaten U.S. regulars, but their work wasn't finished. As the firing died down in Ray's cornfield, Colonel Siegel's Germans were taking it easy. They had pounded Churchill's Arkansas cavalry, driving them from their camps into the woods. Now they waited in a battle line across the wire road in Sharps Field. Rebel prisoners had told some of Siegel's troopers that Price's battle line on Bloody Hill was being beaten. Siegel was confident Lyon would break through it and join his forces at any moment. So he relaxed. While his German infantrymen carelessly lounged in their ranks, General McCullough had moved the 3rd Louisiana from Ray's corn and was marching them down the wire road the Louisianans would finally have a crack at Siegel's hated Dutch soldiers. But Lyon's troops hadn't broken through the rebel line. Instead, they were feverishly trying to maintain their own battle line on Bloody Hill. 
The 1st Missouri, under Lieutenant Colonel George Andrews, had been busy holding Lyon's right flank all morning. He faced two divisions of Price's Missouri State Guard under Brigadier Generals Mosby Parsons and James McBride. The action grew fierce. Price's men, armed mostly with shotguns and hunting rifles, had to get close to the Federals to be effective. McBride's troops lost contact with Parsons' division. They advanced, trying to find Lyon's 1st Missouri. Totten's Union battery found them first. Halting for cover, McBride's men began to exchange volleys with the 1st Missouri and a battalion of Missouri Home Guards under Major Osterhaus. On Bloody Hill, the fight had truly become a civil war. Missourians who had once been neighbors, friends, and even brothers were now desperate enemies. A battalion of the 3rd Louisiana and 70 of Price's Missourians made their way towards Siegel's position under cover of dense thickets and trees. The Pelicans dressed in gray emerged from the undergrowth and formed a line of battle at this point in the war, many units still wore the gray uniforms from their militia days. So, as the 3rd Louisiana advanced within easy musket range, Siegel incorrectly identified them as the Union 1st Iowa, who also wore gray at Wilson's Creek. Siegel thought these were Lyon's victorious troops and ordered his men to hold their fire. Siegel had made an atrocious mistake. The rebels attacked. Siegel's men began shouting in German, they are firing against us. They make a mistake. But these weren't General Lyon's men advancing. Two Confederate batteries opened fire, panicking the dispirited Germans even more. Missouri Captain Hiram Bledsoe's battery hit Siegel's 3rd Missouri from his position on the south slope of Bloody Hill. The Fort Smith, Arkansas battery pummeled the 5th Missouri from the east side of Wilson's Creek. The Germans also faced an attack on their left flank from Arkansas troops under Lieutenant Colonel Dandridge McCray and an element of Missourians from Waitman's Brigade. The Yankees were being hit along every point of their line.
earlier, Siegel had brought up all of his cannon and had them along the wire road in the center of his battle line. The guns were manned by inexperienced crews. Siegel's best artillery crews, who'd proven themselves at Carthage, had gone home when their 90-day enlistments ended. Today, he watched his crews abandon four of their six guns to the Pelicans. The Arkansas and Missouri troops began to pound the 5th Missouri on Siegel's left flank. The Pelicans' well-aimed volleys took their toll from the 3rd Missouri. The German battle line fell apart. The Germans retreated in mass before the Confederate onslaught. By 4.30 that afternoon, small groups of Siegel's men would be straggling into Springfield. Siegel had left the night before with 1,200 men. Only 900 returned. 25% of Siegel's command was killed, maimed, or missing. In addition, the 3rd Missouri's regimental colors had been captured. They would soon be in the hands of General Price. He would put them to good use later that morning. The firing had died down to a lull on Bloody Hill. The morning had been full of attacks and counterattacks. Ground would be gained only to be lost minutes later. McBride and Parsons' attack on Lyon's right flank had failed. By 9 a.m., General Price was ready to strike again. The Confederate line had been bolstered by elements of the Hebert's Pelicans, Churchill's Arkansas troops, and McCullough's Texans. Pierce's troops stood in reserve, the largest single force the rebels had yet put together. Across from them were the 1st Missouri and Colonel George Dietzler's 1st Kansas. 800 men who'd fought the wars against Missourians in bleeding Kansas. Men with old scores to settle. Shortly after 9, Price launched his massive attack, hitting General Lyon's entire 1,000-yard line. The 1st Kansas began taking a beating. Colonel Dietzler was wounded. The Confederate volleys were well aimed. General Lyon called for the 1st Iowa to support the Kansas troops. The Iowans advanced amidst the confused retreat of the Kansans. Private Eugene Ware of the 1st Iowa described the Confederate attack. As they got nearer to us, their own artillery ceased firing because it endangered them. When they got close, the firing began on both sides. Every man was shooting as fast on our side as he could load and yelling as loud as his breath would permit. The foe stopped advancing. Every man assumed the responsibility of doing as much shooting as he could.
1st Iowa did their job. The Louisiana, Missouri, and Arkansas troops fell back with heavy losses. General Lyon had been severely wounded trying to rally the 1st Kansas. Still in the saddle, he tried to keep the Union momentum going. On his order, the 2nd Kansas was brought up. Lyon rode at their front shouting, Come on, my brave boys. I will lead you forward. A mini ball struck his chest. He dismounted into the arms of his orderly, saying, Layman, I am killed. While the battle raged on, his body was left under an oak tree. Lyon was the first Union Civil War general to die in battle. The romance was over. As the fighting began to die down, General McCullough sent Greer's cavalry to attack the Union right flank. The South Kansas Texas Mounted Regiment rode into a sheet of lead. Both Totten and Dubois directed cannon fire at the troopers. Two companies of the 1st Iowa blasted away with musket fire. The attack was routed. Totten would later describe the attack as so ineffectual in its force and character as to deserve only the appellation of child's play. With Lyon dead, the overall Union command was turned over to Major Samuel Sturgis. He'd been in charge of Lyon's 1st Brigade. Now he commanded all of them. He would soon face a new attack. Price had brought up General Pierce's 2,300 Arkansas troops who hadn't fired a shot all morning. Before going in, Price told his troops, you will soon be in a pretty hot place, men, but I'll be near you and will take care of you. Keep as cool as the inside of a cucumber and give them thunder. The 3rd Arkansas advanced up the slopes of Bloody Hill, bearing the regimental colors captured from the 3rd Missouri. Siegel's whereabouts were still unknown to Union commanders. It had been a problem all morning. Union troops had held their fire in the face of advancing Southerners, thinking them to be Siegel's men. Both Dubois and Totten held their fire as the Arkansas troops advanced. Gabor's rebel battery helped end the intrigue. They are rebels, cried the Union skirmishers. A portion of Totten's battery began to pound the 3rd Arkansas's left flank. The 2nd Kansas volleyed in their front. The Arkansas dead soon littered the field. In just 30 minutes, the 3rd Arkansas lost a fifth of their regiment. The rebel attack continued along the entire slope of Bloody Hill. Totten's guns anchoring the center of the Union line came under attack from all the Missourians Price could muster. Totten's cannon and a battalion of regulars under Captain Frederick Steele stood their ground. Confederate Colonel Richard Waitman was mortally wounded. The Missouri attack on Totten's guns helped give Bloody Hill its infamous name.
Around 11 a.m., the rebels began falling back. The Union line had held. But ammunition was running low among Sturgis's men, and they hadn't been able to fill their canteens for the last 14 hours. The Union Army of the West would retreat. Meanwhile, Price was gearing up for yet another attack upon the Union line. His worn-out troops again walked the littered slope they had gotten to know so well. But Sturgis had retreated, and as General Pierce commented, they were glad to see him go. Sturgis met up with elements of Siegel's command and entered Springfield around 5 that evening. The rebels, disorganized and weary, opted not to follow. In Farmer Ray's corn, in Sharp's fields, on Bloody Hill, over 500 men lay dead. Another 1,800 were wounded. The Confederates had lost 12% of all engaged. The Federals, an astonishing 24%, nearly one out of every four men involved. In six hours of fighting, Missouri was baptized to the death and destruction that would follow in the next four years. Out of the battle were born those such as Bloody Bill Anderson, Cole Younger, Frank James, and William Quantrill, men who would leave the Army to terrorize Missouri and Kansas. War had lost its luster. Have been found guilty of the crime of cowardice in the face of the enemy via fleeing the field of action while under fire. The men in the ranks would go on to fight other battles throughout the war. But Wilson's Creek would be remembered as one of the fiercest and one of the bloodiest. The men themselves came to call it a mighty mean fought fight.
if you might be a bride of